Hi guys, Dane here, and today we're going to be making a start, at the very least, on my review of Death Comes to Marlowe by Robert Thorogood. So this is book two in the Marlowe Murder Club series, it's only recently come out. I'm going to read you the blurb, but then I'm going to go through and check out my tabs. I only have one for you at the moment, but I'll check them out as I read the book. And then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end, so... Dane reads... The Marlowe Murder Club meets again. It's been an enjoyable and murder-free time for Judith, Susie and Bex, aka the Marlowe Murder Club, since the shocking events of last year. The most exciting thing on the horizon is the upcoming wedding of Marlowe grandee Sir Peter Bailey. Sir Peter is having a party at his grand mansion on the River Thames the day before the wedding, and Judith and co are looking forward to a bit of free champagne. But during the soiree, the trio hear a crash from inside Sir Peter's house. When they rush to investigate, they find the groom to be crushed to death in his study. The study was locked from the inside, so the police don't consider the death suspicious. But Judith disagrees. As far as she's concerned, Peter was murdered. And it's up to the Marlowe Murder Club to find the killer before they strike again. So as you can tell, it's a locked room mystery. What I like about that as well, I mean, literally, I'm on page 20, so I'm only that far in. And that's taken us pretty much to the end of that the description, the book blurb there. Um, because I hate it when you read a book and the blurb takes you like through the first half of the story, you know? I also want to shout out, we've got praise for Robert Thorogood. So right at the top we've got, I love Thorogood's writing by Peter James, cracking author. And then we have Robert Webb, one of my favorite comedians. A hugely enjoyable murder mystery written with wonderful verve, humor, and compassion. Utterly delightful. So very cool. And the thing I've tabbed out is actually in the opening, uh, the opening paragraphs of chapter one. Um, and the reason is, is because I've experienced this myself, so... When the Christmas lights went up in the high street, she found herself, as she did every year, quietly absenting herself from the festivities. It wasn't that she was opposed to Christmas, far from it. It was more that she felt it belonged to other people, mostly parents with young children and families hell-bent on enforced jo jollity. Jollity. That's a hard word to say. Um, which is kind of my approach to Christmas a little bit, but also I used to work in Marlow where these books are set, so I'm very familiar with like the Christmas market, the Christmas light switch on. And I used to have to push through it every day to get home to, 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 um, to get to the bus stop to get home. So I always felt like a bit of a Grinch doing that and trying to push past everybody who's doing their Christmas shopping. Okay, so we get a reference to Marlow FM, which I think is quite cute. Um, so Susie, when she goes into this room, she just retunes the radio to Marlow FM to increase its reach one one um, listener at a time, which I think is quite cute because that's... I mean, it's a local radio station. Our actual local, local radio station is Wickham Sound, which I have a radio show on. Um, so Marlow FM is kind of like our rivals. And we get this little little bit, which I enjoy this because I like making pesto and I actually figured out the answer to this as they were going through it. Um, but also, I like the, uh, the line about monetizing this skill because that's the kind of thing I would say. So I thought to myself, what would you first chop with a knife that's green and then blitz in the nut grinder of a food mixer with some grated parmesan? The answer's obvious, of course. The other two women looked at each other, no idea what the answer was. It's basil leaves, Beck said, for fresh pesto. Of course, Judith said, unable to keep the laugh out of her voice. Fresh pesto, that was my first thought as well. And when I found a single pine nut in the drainer of the sink, I knew I was right, which meant there had to be olive oil here somewhere, seeing as you use it to make pesto, and it wouldn't be anywhere obvious. You've checked the most likely places, so I looked for the main body of the food processor and saw it was on the far side of the room, and on the little, me and on the little shelf above it are those flowers, but there's also a metal can, which suggested to me that while the basil was chopped and cheese grated on this side of the room, the pesto was made over where the machine is. The metal can must contain the olive oil, it's just a process of deduction. Judith and Susie stared at Bex in wonder. There's got to be a way we can monetize this skill, Susie said. We had pesto pasta for dinner yesterday. Oh, and um, Susie talks about when they found Sir Peter, the murder victim Sir Peter, he was in this locked room, got trapped under a cabinet. We found Sir Peter under the cabinet with his legs sticking out like the Wicked Witch of the West. Susie, Bex yelped, you can't say that. Oh, come on, you can't pretend you didn't think it as well. The poor man was crushed under that bloody great cabinet and all we saw poking out were his salmon pilt trousers and brown brogues. Um, and yes, that just makes me think, I've been reading the Wizard of Oz series recently. Um, but also, there's this locked room thing and everyone's like, we burst into this room and there was no murderer in there. So, um, what happened? I think we're going to find that the murderer hid inside this, the shelves that they had to drag off his body. I think the murderer knocked the shelves over, climbed inside, because it's like a wardrobe thing. That's my theory, so far. We get a reference to Checkers, a pub on Marlow High Street, which I have been in several times. Oh, and I thought this was fun, especially because Shay and I have recently been doing a jigsaw. So I'll just read you this, this little paragraph out. 
The following morning, Judith tried to put Sir Peter's death out of her mind, but she found she couldn't settle. She started to compile a new crossword, but she couldn't quite concentrate, so she went over to her latest jigsaw puzzle to see if that could calm her mind. She got it from the Thames Hospice, and the volunteer at the till had been impressed that Judith was choosing to do a 1,000-piece jigsaw that was a close-up photo of baked beans. What he'd not known is that there was no way Judith would do a jigsaw that contained only baked beans. She found the thought of them on mass revolting. Me too. No, her new idea, just to stretch her a bit, was to turn the puzzle over so that there was no picture for her to follow at all, just a flat grey colour to every piece. But even as she worked on the monochrome jigsaw, her mind kept drifting back to Sir Peter. Someone asked for oat milk, which as a vegan I heartily approve of, and they did have it available, but then it's Marlow, and Marlow is an oat milk kind of place. We get a little bit about info about Peter. Um, so Rosanna thinks he's a misogynist, which he isn't, I hasten to add. He's never hated women. Dear God, he doesn't hate women. But he is pro-man, that much is true. He's very much a chauvinist. We get this great little exchange here, which I think is very true. I won't believe anything that man says. You can spot when he's lying, his mouth's moving. He's not trustworthy. He's a lawyer, Chris said, as though this was all the answer he needed to give. Uh, Susie is working, she's got a radio show on Marlow FM and we find... This was mainly because Marlow FM studio was very small. It was built into an old storeroom at the back of Sea Cadets Hall. Um, I'm not sure whether that's true, but again, that just shows why Wickham Sound is better, because they have a proper studio. Susie says, if you can drive a car, you can drive a radio desk, uh, I suppose. I learned to drive before learning to do a radio desk, but I can drive both if needed. We get a reference to someone putting some, making some vegan dishes for uh, Christmas, which again, approve. We get a reference to uh, the complete Angler Hotel and joining the Thames path in the direction of Bourne End, which is, uh, I've walked that way a few times. We get the question asked, who eats chocolate oranges anymore? I used to, I quite like them. I think of them as a Christmassy food, um, but I can't eat them anymore because they've got milk chocolate in. We get here a reference to the train situation. The following morning, the three women met in the Marlow railway station, a tiny wooden hut on the edge of the town's commercial estate. The only train that ever arrived or left was one carriage long and was known affectionately by locals as the Marlow Donkey. Uh, there's a pub called the Marlow Donkey as well. Uh, I've never taken the train from or into Marlow because it has such crappy connections. I think it just connects Marlow to Maiden. I like this little quote here. If she was a compilation album, you know what it would be called? Now that's what I call mad. And then Judith kind of impersonates a police officer, um, but she, she says she has a way out of it. Uh, if you recall, I said, hello, this is Maidenhead Police Station. I was impersonating a building, and I can't imagine there's any law that says a person can't impersonate a building. Um, I think you would still get done for impersonating a police officer with that, though. We get a reference to Stoke, Desper, and Burnham being constituents of the ancient administrative region known as the Chiltern Hundreds. Um, yeah, Desper Avenue is a big part of Wickham and Desper is like everything's named Desper around here he was actually in the Hellfire Club which is featured in one of my short stories as well so there's this bit that's going on throughout where um, uh, Judith is seeing the four puzzle the four uh, answers in the top four corners of the cryptic crossword are like instructions on where to meet and um, it turns out that the crossword setter and his wife are meeting each other. Um, but it's used as like, it's a kind of mystery going throughout the novel that then gets solved and it kind of has nothing to do with the main mystery, but it does inspire, um, you know, a correct answer as it were. It inspires part of the deduction for the main mystery, even though it's not directly related to it. And I love it when stuff like that happens, when there's this side mystery, doesn't actually matter, but if it didn't get solved, the main mystery wouldn't get solved kind of thing. We get this, uh, she knew from her years of setting crosswords, sometimes the solution, improbable though it first appeared, was nonetheless correct. It was like the time she first learned that the phrase 11 plus 2 was also an anagram of 12 plus 1. It didn't matter how much every instinct in her body said these facts couldn't be true, they were nonetheless true. And that's cool, that's something I'm going to remember. And then obviously we get the denouement towards the end, it was pretty good. Um, I think there were bits of it that I did figure out. It wasn't as I said earlier that there was somebody inside the shelf or whatever. It, I, I think that was just me not correctly grasping what kind of shelf it was. Uh, I did like the way that it was finally done. Um, you know, locked room she's and all of that. It was, it was pretty cool. Um, yeah, it was probably like a week, four out of five, pretty decent detective novel. I love the fact that it was set in Marlow, a lot of fun. Uh, it also has an excerpt from The Queen of Poisons, which is going to be book three, but I never read those excerpts because I'd rather just wait for book three to come out, which I imagine should be quite a while from now. Um, but yes, definitely one, especially if you're into locker room mysteries, check it out. So there we have it, that's what I made of Death Comes to Marlow by Robert Thorogood. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.